your gift. <laughs> well, I got a good life of a madrigal. Oh. But now you all know the family madrigal. Oh. I never meant this to get all of my grandma's oh. oh. Just to review the family madrigal. Oh. 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 It's hard with abuela and the tia papa. She knows the weather. Oh. My mom, Julieta, can make you feel better with just one out of that. My dad, Agustin, well, he's actually in front of me. What are you doing? Uh, they were just asking about the family and... She was about to tell us about her super awesome gift! Oh, Mirabel didn't get one. <laughs> you didn't get a gift? D um... Mirabel! Delivery! I gave you the special since you're the only Madrigal kid with no gift. I call it the not special special since, uh, you have no gift. Thanks. Oh, and tell Antonio good luck. Last gift ceremony was a bummer. Last one being yours, that, that did not work. Mm -hmm. If I was you, I'll be really sad. Well, my little friend, I am not. Because the truth is, gift or no gift, I am just as special as the rest of my family. Who wants more cake? All right, guys, where do I drop the wagon? Maybe your gift is being in denial. <laughs> Welcome to Hope, everyone. My name is Eli Sutterth. I'm one of the ministers here at the Ankeny campus. And welcome to all the kids in the room today. Today is a family worship weekend. We do this intentionally every so often because we feel like it's a great way for us to worship together. We think it's really important for families to have the opportunity to celebrate together in the same room. Our Hope Kids staff and leaders are taking a break this weekend. And I love preaching when it's family worship, when the kids are in the room. Um, and by the way, moms and dads, if your kids make noise, let them. You know, it's no big deal. It's, it's fun. My kids are eight and five. We make noise all the time. Uh, perfectly okay. Um, but it gives me a chance during family worship weekend to look for ways we can all relate to these uh, scriptural ideas together. Uh, that there are themes in Scripture that come up um, in movies and different clips and things like that. So I try to find clips that kids might be into, and boy, are kids into the movie Encanto right now, right? It was even fun to hear some of the kids actually just saying the words along with the, 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 the movie. My kids have seen this like 20 times before I even saw it, and they memorized the whole thing already. So um, it's a fantastic movie, but again, it paints a picture of something that we actually see in Scripture. So the main character... Mirabelle is born into an enchanted family, and Kanto means a place of enchantment or wonder. And when the kids of this family come of age, each of them receives this special gift, like a superpower, and it enables their family to better care for their whole community. Except what happens to Mirabelle is when she comes of age, she doesn't receive a gift. It doesn't work for her, like you heard them say. And she spends much of the rest of the movie uh, exploring why. And why, why would she be surrounded by so many gifted people with all these amazing abilities and she's feeling kind of left out, doesn't know what her place in her own family is? And I wonder if that's ever been you before in your life. As you look around the people who are living out their lives around you, you see people with amazing gifts and amazing abilities. Things that you wish you could do, wondering where your place is. Maybe you've, you know, if you're uh, in school right now, you wonder, you've been the, the new kid at school and where do I fit in? Where's my place? Sometimes I think the, the church can feel that way. If you're just checking out Christianity for the first time and, 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 and joining us as a guest today, wondering, you know, is, is, is the church something that I could belong to? Where would my place be? And maybe coming from the outside looking in, you might think that, you know, if I don't play a musical instrument or if public speaking isn't my thing, then is there really a place for me in the church at all? That's what I see people doing, and I don't do those things, so maybe I'm just a spectator. You know, I, I'll watch other people do their gifts all the time, wondering, where do I fit in? And, and the reality is, the Bible points us in a different direction. The scripture reading for today paints a completely different picture for what the life of the church is actually supposed to look like. It tells us a different story. The vision for the church the way that God envisions His people to work together 
is painted for us here in Romans chapter 12. This is from our scripture reading today, Romans 12 verse 4. It'll be up on the screen. Let's read this together out loud. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Here in the book of Romans, the the writer Paul, who is writing to the church in Rome, is painting this picture for what the church should look like. And he uses the, the metaphor here of a body. Other parts of Scripture talk about a family, that we're all brothers and sisters, but here and elsewhere, it depicts the church as a physical body and that each one of us is is a body part, a member of that body, and that no one member is more important than any of the others, the Bible tells us in other passages, that we are all part of the same whole and that we are existing in community together to use our gifts and our abilities to help the church grow, that we all belong to one another using our gifts, using our abilities to to help the church be what it truly is. And then Paul goes on to describe some of what are called spiritual gifts in the Bible. He lists some things that you heard in the Bible reading like the gift of encouragement or the gift of leadership or of, of, of ministry or of giving. And there are all kinds of lists in the New Testament of, of spiritual gifts. And if I was to go through all of them, it would just take way too long. So for me, when I talk about spiritual gifts with people in the church, Ephesians chapter 4, I think, gives us maybe an overarching idea. These gifts that are listed in Ephesians 4 kind of form an umbrella over the other gifts that are listed in the Bible. These five gifts, I think, help us to understand where each one of us might fit into the body of Christ, a way that the Holy Spirit has uniquely gifted you. Different than your, your talents or your abilities, The spiritual gifts that God gives each person who belongs to his family are are uniquely given by God to build up the church. And so I look at these five gifts in Ephesians 4 as as a way for each one of us to connect. That my hope as we go through this morning, you you would hear about these gifts and think, that sounds like me. I relate to that idea. Uh, and then to go out and explore what that might look like for you to use that gift. So in Ephesians 4, this again is something that Paul is writing to a church that he helped start. So there are some similar themes. He talks about being one body united in Christ with the same Holy Spirit. And he said, so Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the body for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And that really is the purpose of our spiritual gifts. Not just to find out where I fit in so that I can feel fulfilled, although that does happen. The real purpose is so that when all of us are using our gifts together, the church is built up. The body of Christ grows. It's healthy. It's strong. And that's our desire for our church, that all of these gifts play a part. But how do we, how do we understand these things? I mean, these are some words that I don't know about you, we don't often, I don't often use the word apostle when I'm talking about things outside of church work or prophecy. What's a prophet really do? Some people in Christianity even today think that there are no such thing as spiritual gifts. You know, that these things existed in Bible times, but that they've, they've stopped now. But the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, I think the Bible's pretty clear that as long as there is a thing called the church, There will be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, but for us it can be difficult to understand what those things mean. Even some of our translations, yours might say instead of shepherds, it might say pastors. It's the same word in Greek. I think think shepherds is a little bit more helpful. I'll explain why in a bit, but even you might think of pastor as a job description that people just have, and if you don't have it, how would you know you had that spiritual gift? So what ha- what's helpful for me when I think about these things is to look at the lives of, of people God has used maybe more in our contemporary contexts, closer to our own lifetime, the ways God has used individuals with these spiritual gifts to build up the body, to reach out to the world around us, and to help the church grow. So as we move through, I want you to, again, keep in mind if, if these things sound familiar to you, if one of these sounds like it might be you, this is an opportunity for you to explore that spiritual gift so we can all be working together to help the body of Christ grow. The first one that's listed are apostles. Apostle comes from this Greek word apostolos, which is absolutely no help whatsoever because it's the exact same word in English. But you might notice or maybe remember 
after Jesus Christ is crucified and resurrected and he, he ascends into heaven, all of his disciples are gathered there and he, he gives what's called the great commission for the church. Jesus tells his disciples to make disciples of all the nations, to go out into the world and, and make more disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the, the mission statement for the church forever, to make disciples and to baptize them. And all of a sudden, Jesus' disciples start being called apostles. And it's just a shift in idea. A disciple is somebody who is a follower. They, they follow their teacher, their leader. And an apostle is somebody who is then sent out to do the work that they learned how to do while they were following. That an apostle is someone who gets outside of, the, the, the in our case, the walls of the church to engage with people who, who are, are maybe on the outside, to, to find new ways to interact with people. Apostles do new work, new things. They're sent out. They're commissioned. They don't necessarily take care of the internal works of whatever they're a part of. They go out from it. And you might have that spiritual gift. If you're constantly thinking about people who are on the outside of the church, this might be you. So we have the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, whose letters we read, they make up a lot of the New Testament in the Bible. And this is a map of Paul's journey as he is planting new churches all over the Mediterranean region in the first century. And what Paul did as an apostle was he would go to one town and he would make disciples and help them understand Jesus and their spiritual gifts. And after spending months and years with them, he would then establish a church in a city and move on. He would say, you're now a church and I'm going to go to the next city and build one there. And he would do that. He did that several times for years and years at the end of his life. And that's how the first century church grew. It's still how the church grows People at Lutheran Church of Hope who have this spiritual gift are the ones helping us plant new campuses and new local sites, helping us think about online ministry and new ministries outside of the church. These gifts are alive and active. People who love to start new things have this spiritual gift. And, and somebody, I think, who inspired me in the last hundred years or so, her story, who I believe God used with the gift of apostleship, is a woman named Dorothy Day. And Dorothy Day, if you're not familiar with that name, I think she's best known for uh, having started a, a social activist magazine in the 1930s called The Catholic Worker, if you know that name. She started this magazine in the 30s, but her life was, was dynamic and complex well before then. She was actually born just before 1900, and she wasn't born into a Christian home. She didn't have faith growing up, but she always felt drawn to the Bible for some reason. There were Bibles around her house, and she would just pick it up and read. She was a voracious reader. She actually began a career very young as a journalist. For a woman in the, in the, in the teens and 20s, that was a unique thing. She would be writing articles and books and magazines for different newspapers and things. And because of the time when she was born, she covered some amazing world events, but from a unique perspective because she was drawn to the Bible and she was also always drawn to people on the fringes of society. She just felt like she wanted to spend more time with people who were trapped in poverty or people who were stuck in, 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 in parts of society that were broken in prisons and, and all kinds of places where, where just their stories weren't getting told. So she covered, you know, both world wars. She covered the Great Depression, but from the perspective of the worker who had lost their job. She uh, was arrested several times, once marching for the women's right to vote in 1919 in, in Washington, D.C., went on hunger strike for that. Um, she uh, actually volunteered as a nurse during the, the last giant flu pandemic in 1918, back when you could do such a thing as, hey, there are a lot of sick people, I think I'll just volunteer to be a nurse in Brooklyn for a year, and she did that. That's where she just felt naturally drawn. If you have the gift of apostleship, you feel pulled to a direction where people aren't currently caring for those groups of people. And as she's being drawn in, she, she keeps reading the Bible and she sees on the pages of Scripture this guy called Jesus who's doing the same things. Jesus is spending all of his time with people who are poor, people who are sick, people who are dismissed by conventional society. That's where Jesus is focused, and so she thought, man, I, I want to develop a relationship with this guy who I'm reading about in Scripture. She gives her life to Jesus, and she, she joins the Catholic Church. She spends so much time in these big cities. The Catholic Church is really the, the faith community she has the easiest access to. 
And she starts to grow in her faith there, but she begins to realize there's some kind of a disconnect between where she feels drawn as a new Christian, wanting to spend time and raise awareness for people who are at the bottom of society, and the way that the church is behaving. Now, the church wasn't doing anything wrong necessarily, but she wrote this in her uh, autobiography. It's a book called The Long Loneliness. If you ever get a chance to read it, it's an amazing book. And she said this, there was plenty of charity but too little justice, meaning the church was willing to hand out plenty of money to people who were in poverty and to give them financial assistance, but the church wasn't willing to actually address the broken social structures that kept people in poverty, and she wanted the church to do that. So with her limitless journalistic experience, profound writing ability, but no money whatsoever, she starts this magazine called The Catholic Worker to raise awareness for people about what's really going on under the surface of their society, ways that the systems are broken, that that Christians can, can then rise up and actually do something about. And she starts this around her kitchen table with her family. Her and her daughter went out on the street selling the first editions just to raise circulation. And again, people with apostleship gifts will do that. They have a vision, an idea for a ministry or something that just has to start, and they're going to make it happen no matter what, pursue it no matter what, relentlessly. And over the years of her working on this and building it up and bringing more and more people in to write and to raise awareness, hundreds of thousands of people start subscribing to this magazine. And the circulation starts to go all over the world. Millions of people then start picking up on this idea of what it looks like to live out your Christian faith. And then she starts to actually put some things into action and and they begin homeless shelters based on what she's writing because such a thing didn't exist yet. And then all of a sudden, all these Catholic worker communities start popping up all over the world because of this newsletter that she's written. And by the time that she passed in 1980, there were hundreds of Catholic worker communities all over the world. In fact, there are still 187 around the world today. One's in Des Moines. This this vision that she had of of doing a new thing, of, of, of doing ministry for people who no one was doing ministry for yet continues to persist today. In fact, Paul writes about this this ambition of being an apostle. It's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. And that might be you. You might might already be doing this in your life without realizing it, starting new projects or new businesses. But that's the type of gift that the church desperately needs. That's how the church continues to grow, starting new things for people who aren't yet connected to the community because they're the type of people who we haven't paid attention to yet. And apostles love to start those things, but prophets are the ones who actually remind us of who we're supposed to be paying attention to. That's the next group of people in our list from Ephesians chapter 4, the prophets. And if we're going to talk about prophets, then we have to talk about Bruno, right? Kids get it. We have to talk about Bruno from the movie Encanto. You see, Bruno was a prophetic voice in his own family. When Bruno came of age in the movie, he he is given this gift where he is able to see visions about things that are going on in his community behind the scenes and some things about his family that are troubling to him. On the outside, this family looks perfect. It looks like it has it all together. There's a beautiful facade on their home and on their life. But Bruno, in his vision, sees some cracks that are starting to form in the foundation of their family and of their community. And as he shares these visions, he's actually ridiculed, pushed aside, dismissed because of the things that he is saying. People don't want to hear that there are problems. People don't want to hear that there's trouble when you think that things are perfect on the outside. And that's really what prophets do. Often when we hear the word prophecy, we we have this misconception that we think that they're predicting things about the future that that's what a prophecy means. We're going to predict what's going to happen in the future. Sometimes that's the case, but I would encourage you to actually read some of the the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, these these major prophets of the Bible, because what they do more often than, than predict the future, they actually proclaim who God really is and what God cares most about. That's what a prophet does. They are uniquely tuned in to the voice of the Holy Spirit that reminds the whole church, this is who God is. Don't forget. And these are the people God wants us to pay attention to. Don't forget. 
And that, that all the outside of us that we think is perfect and looking great, if we've got issues on the inside of us that's corrupting us from the inside out, prophets will notice that and they'll want us to pay attention to remember so that we can stay healthy and strong. In fact, this is what Isaiah said. Jesus quotes this scripture when he starts his ministry, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. This isn't a prediction about the future. This is a a declaration of who God is and what God cares most about. We need to pay attention to those things. Because what often happens, unfortunately, is we push those people away. They have some hard things to say for us, not because they're untrue, but because they're so true it hurts sometimes. It's inconvenient to pay attention to those people that God really wants us to take care of. It's inconvenient to address the the cracks in the foundation of our church, of our world, When we would rather focus on all the good things that are happening and and the ways things are right and perfect on the outside, it's really hard to focus on the things that are broken that we need to fix. And so we push prophets away. We try to get them away from us because they say hard things. And that's what happened to Bruno in Encanto. He kept saying these, these difficult visions for people and they kept pushing him farther and farther away until finally he just decides he was going to leave his family that it was too hard to keep speaking these things to his family, to his community. He thought he was just better off walking away. Let's see what happens. Wait, have you been in here patching the cracks? Oh, that? No, 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 no. I'm too scared to go near those things. All the patching's done by Hernando. Who is Hernando? I'm Hernando and I'm scared of nothing. Actually, me. <laughs> I used to say my real gift was acting. <laughs> I'm Jorge. I made the sparkle. How long have you been back here? You never left. Oh, I, I, I left my tower, which was, you know, a lot of stairs, and uh, in here, eh? Kitchen adjacent. Ooh, ooh, plus free entertainment. So what, what do you like? What do you like? You like sports? Game shows. Telenovelas. That love could never be. I don't understand. Well, because she's his aunt and she has amnesia. So she can't remember that she's his aunt. It's like a very forbidden kind I of... I don't <laughs> understand why you left but didn't leave. Oh, well, because... <laughs> You know, the mountains around the Encanto are, are pretty tall, and, uh, and like, you know, like I said, free food and everything. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you guys love the free food, don't you? It's, it's always hungry, never satisfied. Yeah, my, my gift wasn't helping the family, but, uh, but I love my family, you know? We need people with prophetic giftings to stay inside of the family of God as a part of the body to help keep us healthy, even when they have hard things to say to remind us of who God is and what he cares most about. One of the most important prophetic voices for the church in the last hundred years is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was himself a Christian and viewed that what he was doing as a part of the civil rights movement, as a ministry for the church, for the whole world, the the, the God that he read about in Scripture was a God who cared passionately about people who were persecuted, people who were put down by society, and that that the the realization of who God is in Scripture is one who breaks down social barriers, that because of our relationship with Jesus, there is, the Bible says, no longer Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, nor male nor female. We are all one, united in Jesus Christ. And as a prophetic voice, he would simply quote Scripture again and again to remind us of who God is and what God cares about. His, his letter to the Birming, from the Birmingham jail, if you've ever read it, is actually addressed to clergy. Because the church was critical of what he was doing, unfortunately. More pastors and leaders of churches kept telling him he was doing too much, too quick, in all the wrong ways. And he said, no, this is who God really is. 
We need to address this. This is a crack in the foundation of our entire society and especially of the church. And so he quotes scripture back to clergy saying, remember what God says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. This is why we need people with prophetic wisdom inside of our church. To, to help us to remember who God is, to make us pay attention to the places where, where we're just blind. We, we get so focused on caring for our own needs, on taking care of our own preferences, that we forget who God told us to be paying attention to. And somebody in our church who I believe has some prophetic gifting came to me a couple weeks ago and, and she said, I think we should be doing more for people in the criminal justice system in our society people who are incarcerated, people who are in jails, because Jesus tells us to visit those who are in prison, and as a church, we don't. And that'd be really convenient for me to say, well, we're, we're awfully busy right now. We have a lot of other ministries going on, and, and you know, it might be fine just for us to ignore that, that mandate from Jesus, you know, to pretend like over and over again in Scripture, God didn't tell us to actually pay attention to people who were in prisons, to visit them. And I said, no, you're right. We should be doing more. And what can we do? And so she said, there's this class that Prison Fellowship puts on. It's one of Hope's missions partners, and it's called Outrageous Justice. This can help us to better understand in our present context how we can better love people who are in jails and reach out to them and really be the church for them to, to grow in that part of our ministry, again, to become healthy and strong. They need to be a part of who we are. So we're going to offer this class just after Easter. I'd encourage you to sign up for this. Whether or not you're interested in it, I think it's going to be good for all of us. I'll be there, and you can register for it. We're going to go through this book together and figure out, again, how we can grow as a church, reaching out to the people who aren't yet part of this movement, because they should be. And if you have these types of prophetic ideas about the, the ways that we can grow as a church, we want to hear from you. We want to help you use that gift inside the church so you don't feel like you're pushed to the side with no room for you. There's room for you here. You're the people who help us rem remember what God really cares about so that we can be a stronger church. So that's apostles and then prophets and then evangelists kind of come in where, where that groundwork is laid. As we're reaching out to these new people, evangelists have this spiritual gift of, of sharing good news with people. The word evangelism in Greek just means to proclaim good news. And I think one of the most important evangelists from the last hundred years is a man named Albert. And if you've been with me in the Alpha course, uh, and you already know this story because I like to talk about Albert when I'm teaching Alpha, don't ruin the ending for everybody else. So Albert, I think, is one of the most important evangelists in America in the last hundred years. In 1934, uh, about the time when Dorothy Day was launching the Catholic Worker, a tent revival meeting came through Charlotte, North Carolina, where Albert was working on his family's farm. Tent revivals, if you weren't around in the 30s, which I don't think any of us probably were, it's kind of like a circus, but for Christians, I think that's fair. Big tent, lots of seats and a stage, uh, and they would travel from town to town preaching the gospel and helping people come to faith in Jesus Christ. It was a way for them to share the good news. And this revival came through Charlotte and uh, stayed there for 11 days. Every single day they did something, they weren't messing around. Albert went on that first day and he heard the good news of Jesus, that God loves you. That God loves you so much that he gave his son to pay the penalty for your sins so that you could have a relationship with God for all of eternity. That he has set you free from everything that is holding you back in life. And Albert gave his life to Jesus. He's about 15 years old at the time. And he decided he wanted to invite his friends and his family to, to hear the next day. So he started inviting people and one of his best friends who actually worked on his family's farm with him, he, he invited him and he said, I really think that you should come with me tomorrow because it's going to be amazing. You have to hear this good news. It's changed my life. But his, his friend, who's 15 at the time, he said, no, I have no interest in spiritual things. I don't care about the Bible. I really don't want to go to church. You know, I don't really care about any of that stuff. I'm 15 years old. I'm a boy. I'm, you know, just enjoying life. Then, and maybe if you're, you know, in that age of life, you're part of our power life or ignition ministry, you might know what that feels like. You might have invited people to come with you on Wednesday nights to those ministries and heard the same thing. But Albert kept inviting his friend every single day. You just have to come and check this out. Finally, Albert said, look, you can drive my dad's truck if you just give me a ride to the revival meeting. You don't have to go inside. 
You can wait in the parking lot, but I'll let you drive my dad's car if you get us there. And of course, what 15-year-old boy is going to resist that offer? So his friend drives him to the revival meeting. Albert goes inside the tent and his friend just waits in the parking lot. Of course, he can hear what's happening. He can hear the speaking and the music that's going on. He's curious, so he said, I'll just, I'll check that out. I'll, I'll see what all the fuss is about. I'll just peek inside the tent. I'm not going to stay. And he looked inside and heard what was going on. And, and that was the day that Billy Graham gave his life to Jesus Christ. The, the, Billy Graham peeked inside that tent and, and heard for the very first time about a God who loves him and a God who wants to forgive him for his sins and remove everything from his life that's unhelpful and give him an eternal relationship through Jesus Christ. And, and Billy Graham walked forward during the, the, the famous evangelist song, Just As I Am, and surrendered his life to Jesus, and he decided he wanted to go tell his friends. And he starts telling dozens and hundreds and thousands and millions upon millions of people all over the world for the next 70 years of his life. And typically, I think that's what comes to mind when we think of evangelism. Somebody like Billy Graham who stands up in front of thousands and thousands of people preaching this compelling message of the gospel of a God who loves them and how they can have a relationship with Jesus forever by putting their faith and trust in Him and people come forward and respond. And There wouldn't have been a Billy Graham if there hadn't been an Albert McMakin, a friend who just said, come and check this out. You're invited. That's what an evangelist really does. They invite people into a context where they can meet Jesus, and that's what Jesus actually does with his disciples. John chapter 1, when Jesus is just beginning, they said, these people said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus didn't say, well, it's, it's over there, go check it out. He didn't say, here's our website or find us on Facebook. Come, he replied, and you will see. Come with me and I'll show you. I'll show you what it's like. This thing that has changed my life, I want to invite you into it. If you, if you can't help but invite people, you have the spiritual gift of evangelism. But even if you don't, the Bible tells us that all of us should follow this example. We're all followers of Jesus Christ. Easter Sunday is right around the corner. And on Easter Sunday, more people in our community are, are just willing to come to church than perhaps any other weekend of the year. It's a great Sunday just to invite your friends and your family and your neighbors to come and check it out. Come and see for themselves. I mean, you don't even know. You might be inviting the next Billy Graham just to walk in and check it out. Ask him for a ride. They can wait in the parking lot. Whatever it takes, God wants people to belong to this community. Because for as much as we are seeking for our place, how many more people are out in the world who have no idea that God wants to bless them by giving them spiritual gifts to grow up his kingdom? to help more people experience the love of God for themselves, and to get connected to a community of faith. Because when they're connected, that's really when, when people who have the gift of, of shepherding, of pastoring, that's when they come alive. People who have the gift of, of pastoring, or I think, again, the word shepherd is probably a better translation of that word. Because when we think of pastors, I, I, I'm sure most of us think of a, a person who has that job. They're called pastor. And, and, of course, we have some here at Hope, you know, Pastor Ashley, Pastor Scott. We have people on staff around Hope who are gifted with that spiritual gift, and they do it as a job. But each and every one of you who has the spiritual gift of shepherding, can do that for your church, for your community. Because this is Lutheran Church of Hope, I like to remind us of one of the things that Martin Luther said and wrote about that was distinctive about the church. He said that we belong to a priesthood of all believers. That there, There's no one gift that's more important than any other. There's no one person that's more important than any other. Each and every one of us has a spiritual gift. And if yours is the gift of shepherding, of pastoring, then there's a way for you to do that in this church. And this comes from 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a special possession of God's own. All of us, you are all a royal priesthood. And many of you have the spiritual gift of, of shepherding, of wanting to help people who are inside the community of faith grow in that faith. To pray for people, to visit people, to care for people who are in need to walk alongside people in the church who are going through some of the most difficult times in their lives, to, to visit people who are sick, to, to sit with people in their addictions. There are all kinds of ways for you to shepherd people here in the church. And one of the shepherds in the history of the church who has been an inspiration to me um, is, is Archbishop Oscar Romero. 
If you don't know who he is, by 1979, Archbishop Romero had already been a priest in El Salvador for 35 years. He had had a long career by then in El Salvador, leading and, and shepherding and teaching in the Catholic Church and raising awareness, again, and defending people in his community for social justice, for uh, raising people up out of poverty. He was an important voice in their history, and so he was ordained archbishop. But in 1979, that's when the Salvadoran Civil War broke out. And a violent military government took over control of that country, committing terrible human rights atrocities, awful things targeted at civilians, and, and tremendous suffering took place. And Archbishop Romero, instead of leaving, decided that he was going to stay in El Salvador. He was going to, to, to stay and stand up for and advocate for his people. He was going to be someone who stood between this violent military government and his flock, you know, often when we think of, of shepherding, sort of this pastoral, almost weak image comes to mind. And there certainly is a lot of humility that goes along with it, but I want to remind you of what a shepherd really does, really did. King David, before he was king in the Old Testament, wrote about what it meant to be a shepherd. He said, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. It takes guts to be a pastor. It takes real courage, if you have the gift of shepherding, to walk alongside with people in their darkest moments when things get really hard. Or like this shepherd or like Jesus who we sang about, when a sheep goes wandering off, they go and find it. They go rescue it, protect it. So when Archbishop Romero begins preaching out against what's happening over the radio and advocating to other governments, including meeting with the President of the United States and doing all these things to, to make sure the world was watching, he preached this out over the radio directly at the military. If out of love for others you give your life for others like I am going to give mine, you will have an abundant harvest. You will experience the deepest satisfaction. And a year after he preached that, he was assassinated because he chose to stand between violence and his flock, to shepherd people in the truest sense of the word, from a, a spiritual giftedness that some of you might have too. So if you, if you have that gift and you want to walk alongside people, pray for people, visit people, there's a way for you to do that, to be a pastor here at our church. There's, there's way too many people as a part of our community for just a couple of staff to be your pastors. Each one of us, as a priesthood of all believers, there's a place for you to serve if that's your gift. And then teachers are kind of a part of that. Teachers come alongside shepherds and, again, help us grow in our faith by, by, by letting us understand some of the depth and richness and complexity of what it means to follow God. And you'll have different teachers throughout your faith journey. They, 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 they will speak to you in certain moments and help you understand concepts that you just didn't understand before or explain Scripture in a way that really makes sense for you. And somebody who's done that for me since I was a young guy is the, the author and, and professor C.S. Lewis. Lewis, like Dorothy Day, he came to faith late in life. Uh, he was a highly intellectual person. In fact, he was a professor at Oxford. And he had all these intellectual hurdles to overcome. He, he started off life thinking that faith, that religion, was for people who were not very bright. You know, they needed that to pacify them. They were, just weren't smart enough to understand how the world really was. But as he started to kind of pull on the threads of theology and really explore the claims of Jesus Christ... He kept digging deeper and deeper and realizing that there was a tremendous amount of depth and richness to who God is, to who Jesus is, that it was intellectually stimulating to have faith and that really coming to faith in Jesus opened up so many more doors for him intellectually. And so he would spend the rest of his life writing books for, you know, kids with the Narnia series all the way up through really uh, deep theological insights and still read them today. He, he said this once about, about spiritual gifts. God gives his gifts where he finds the vessel empty enough to receive them. He gives his gifts where he finds the vessel empty enough to receive them. I think for, for some of us, what's difficult about thinking about your spiritual gift is that our lives become so full of other things, other activities, that we don't have room to start new things 
if you're an apostle, or to, to, to give prophetic words of wisdom for the church, or to invite others to join you, or to, to walk alongside other people. Our lives just become so full that, that our spiritual giftedness gets pushed off to the side. I think for, for others of us, the trouble is thinking that, that in order for me to, to, to actually be effective, that I need to know everything about my spiritual gift, that until I know how I'm gifted, what my place is in the church, I can't be useful to God at all, that I need to find my place and find my purpose and then, and then God can use me. And the trouble with that is that God never asked you to be useful. God never asked us to be useful for Him. The two most important commandments that Jesus gave, that he told us, this is who God is, this is what God cares about. The two most important commands are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. When we act out of our spiritual gifts, it's not for us. It's because we love God and we love people so much that if you have the gift of apostleship, you just love the people who are on the outside and you want to reach them any way possible. Or the gift of prophecy, not to, make your, not to make your family hate you or feel bad, but it's because you love your family so much that you don't want to see them going the wrong direction. When we do evangelism, it's not to make people feel bad about their sin or to condemn them because Jesus didn't. It's to invite them into a relationship with a God who loves them. Discipleship, pastoring, teaching, it's the same thing. It's out of love. Paul says this about the gifts. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge... And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So so know your gifts. If one of these sounds like it's you, like it's familiar to you, explore that. Make room for it. Empty yourself from some of the, the busyness that's keeping you from living that out. But also remember that it comes from a place of of Love of a desire to love God and to love other people, to extend that love to the world around us, to help the church grow stronger and stronger all the time. That's what our gifts are for. So let's stand together, and I'd like to pray for us as we start to close our time in worship. God, we thank you that that you have invited all of us to participate with you in this rescue mission that Jesus started. That that Jesus came into the world because you love us and you sent his son to die for us. But that just starts the the rescue mission of us extending that love to the world around us. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit has given us gifts and the abilities to do that. Help us to know what they are. But more than anything, God, I pray that you would help us to, to use those things to love the world around us. Open our eyes to see the places where we can do new things to the ways we can invite more people to, to enjoy this community, to really receive your love and to grow in their faith. We're so grateful, God, that you're with us and that we have this community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.